Good evening and welcome to the Monday edition of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzaman Dongwa Kumalo. It's episode 247 of the public uh, of the private property podcast. You can see I'm already thinking public holiday, you know. Um, and of course, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome to the show. I do hope that you're going to enjoy your first dose of the podcast. But also do make sure that you go back to our old episodes that you have missed out on. We've got a host of great content that you have ca- you've missed out on that you can catch on Facebook as well as on our YouTube page. To all our regular viewers, welcome back. You know how we do it. Every single weekday at 7 p.m., you and I have an appointment. Where we always tackle a hot property issue that helps us make better property decisions. Now, it doesn't matter whether you are a seller, you're a buyer, you're a tenant, you're a landlord, or you're looking to build. This is the podcast that you want to make sure you're always tuned into for all of your property needs. Now, I know that many of you are saying earlier that I'm already thinking about the public holiday. Remember, we're not going to be on air tomorrow uh, evening, so that gives you a great opportunity to catch up on some of the great shows that uh, you have had. We're still going to be on social media, so do keep your eyes locked onto our social media pages. And talking of our social media pages, do make sure that you follow us across all our social media pages. I'm talking Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, as well as our YouTube channel. There's quite a whole host of great content that you can catch up on there. You can follow myself at Zamantungwa underscore K on Twitter as well as on Instagram. And talking about social media, one of the other things that you're going to see on our pages are, of course, the great shows that we have on offer. As it is a Monday, Chad is going to bring you the first, the, the home shoppers show, rather. You can already say I'm in holiday mode. I'm just thinking about the end of the show and to kickstart that long weekend that I'm sure many of you had the foresight to take uh, uh, you know, a day off this evening. But Chad is going to be taking you through the Home Shoppers show later this evening at 8 p.m. And that show will also be back on your screens on Friday at the same time. So if you're in the property market for a new property, then do make sure that you tune into the show. He takes you through incredible properties that you can find also on our website on www.privateproperty.co.com. And every Tuesdays and Thursdays, award-winning farmer Umbali Noko takes you through the farming podcast. So all your agricultural needs are taken care of on that show. And of course, if you want to, you know, enter the agricultural sector, doesn't matter where in the value chain, that is a show that you want to make sure you reach out to and watch every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. 
course, AC class on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. brings you the first time home, uh, the first time home buyers show uh, on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. That's one that you definitely do not want to miss out. You can also catch Esty on our TikTok, where she does really, really great uh, you know, content on our TikTok. So we now are on TikTok. So do also make sure that you follow us. I always forget to mention TikTok because I'm I haven't caught on to getting a TikTok account, uh, but I absolutely love consuming all the great content that gets posted there and, of course, gets reposted across all the other social media platforms. Well, to get us started with our evening's conversation, we are looking at, you know, how REITs are combating a challenging real estate market under COVID-19. And I want to hear from you at home, particularly, you know, those who are property investors, perhaps you've got one or multiple uh, investment properties. How have you gone about, you know, attempting to combat the effects of COVID-19? Perhaps you have, you know, taken uh, a decision to do month-to-month leases. Perhaps you have decreased your rental slightly, uh, just so you're able to catch the tenants um, at the right price point, because we've seen that pricing has been a very competitive uh, component during COVID-19. So I want to hear from you at home, what are some of the strategies that you are currently using as a property investor to combat some of the challenges that we have seen um, during this pandemic? Now, to help us better understand what REITs are doing to do just that i'm joined this evening by somebody that we've had on the show before and we'll continue to have in future episodes that is john jack who is the ceo of galetti corporate real estate john good evening and thank you so much for joining us thanks emma thanks for having me you know, John, we're talking off air, and I think that's actually where I want us to, to start off. We're talking off air, um, and we're saying to you, so one of the questions I typically like asking my guests off air before we come on, uh, just so I also get a great sense of what's happening within the industry and at different levels, is you know how quarter one has been doing, uh, or how quarter one did, rather. And, and I think share, John, with you know my viewers what you had said in terms of the, what you've observed in terms of what you saw during quarter one of this year? Sure. So, yeah, it's an interesting one because, you know, we've got a, we're a service provider. So we're in the advisory space. We do leasing and sales, uh, occupier advisory. And so the REITs are our clients. And so we see what steps they're taking. And we also see what activity there is in the market. We deal directly with occupiers or tenants. And, you know, where there was a lot of business that was concluded that rolled over from last year. At the beginning of this year, we saw a lot of new business coming in and, and, you know, it's quite exciting. We thought, well, this is obviously pent up demand from, you know, that those lockdown restrictions, people are starting to take decisions. But what we quickly worked out is that people are taking a long time to take those decisions, you know, so they, they're being extra vigilant in the, in the decisions that they take for their business. And they're being quite clever in terms of the ways that they structure their leases in terms of the way that they decide whether they're going to own or lease. And so, the, it's almost as though the tenant or occupier has now started to think real estate as opposed to just think in the vein of, of their own business, be it a, an architect or a, a lawyer or a manufacturer. They've actually started to think about their real estate piece because they realize it can make or break them when it comes to events, one-off events like last year. You know, John, I actually love how you just mentioned how um, a lot of the people that you're encountering now, a lot of the businesses that you're encountering now are thinking real estate and not just thinking about their businesses. I want you to just take us through what thinking real estate, particularly from the lens of uh, you know, the clients that you deal with would, would look like. Because I, I, mean, I, I look at property from so many various dimensions. There are almost different entry points uh, I can look at, but certainly from the lens of a lot of the, I'll say the corporate clients, because you're mostly you know, in, in the corporate real estate sector as opposed to, for example, resi- residential sector. So what does thinking real estate, you know, ultimately look like? Because I think this is beneficial for viewers who are also just looking to get, for example, residential real estate for investment purposes, because you also need to think beyond, you know, getting that additional property for the sake of getting it, right? You, you'd have to understand some of the real estate fundamentals and really just think through it where in, in a previous, I'll say, market market, you could afford to buy without knowing too much. Um, you know, the, the margin of error and of loss was relatively lower, but the stakes are slightly different now. I mean, even the consumer is is fairly different. So what does thinking real estate, um, particularly from a corporate lens, ultimately look like? 
Sure. You know, I'll speak corporate first and then I can speak residential because I've basically been a customer in that space recently and, and learnings have been fascinating. But speaking from a corporate perspective, the, the occupier is really looking at a way to mitigate risk. And that risk mitigation comes in sort of seven, several different uh, uh, means. And the, one of the first ones is, if I'm committed to a long-term lease, what does that actually mean? If we face another black swan event, you know, hopefully we don't. But if we face another serious lockdown, what does that mean for me as a tenant? How do I get on the same terms as, as my landlord? Now, you have to think of the landlord as a business at the same time. You're in the business of legal work or you're in the business of architecture or whatever it might be. The landlord is in the business of property. They've deployed capital to own a property to, to rent it. You've deployed capital to uh, employ people that can provide a service. Or, you know, so you have to think about these businesses as businesses. Everyone thinks, oh, the landlord, and so it's, a, it's a bit of a combative thing. You know, well, the landlord must uh, halve our rental or stop charging me or, or whatever it is. And, and it's not that easy. The landlord's got and deployed a lot of capital to own that property for you to go and for you to go and occupy it and so you you need to start off by getting on the same page and say well what are the structures that we can employ to try and get on the same page and one one of the interesting ones recently is we've seen tenants coming up they sign a long term lease and let's say for example they need a thousand square meters they might sign 700 square meters on a more permanent or long term basis so that they can get all the benefits that go along with that a landlord might pay them a tenant and a tenant and set a tenant installation allowance or a give them a rent free period or basically provide them with some capex to outlay to fit that space out whereas if you just wanted to sign a month to month or a flexible lease the landlord is less likely to go and deploy more capital to fit your space out or give you rent freeze and that kind of thing because then that's just prolonging their sort of negative negative rental position and so they what the tenant does is they'll sign for seventy percent of their space. They'll sign on a on a long term lease, and thirty percent of their lease they'll sign on flexible terms. So if in the instance that they do need to suddenly surrender a whole lot of space, they can get rid of their thirty percent of their space on a flexible basis. And that's a great idea. That's a great example of like getting on the same page. You know, you can get rid of some of it, but not all of it. The landlord will have to give up some rental, but not all of it. And and that's probably a, a good example of getting on the same page. Mm. And, and, and John, so I'm, I'm keen then to hear the, the residential side. You said that you're a new customer uh, in that respect. I mean, that's the, that's the playground that I'm in. I'm, I'm both a, a customer, but also a you know, service provider. So it's quite an interesting, interesting space. I want to hear your take on how you're navigating uh, that area. Yeah, so I'm based in Johannesburg. Um, and, you know, there's the, the, the old adage of the cobbler's son never has shoes. Well, you know, I'm in real estate. I understand real estate. That's, that's our business. But when it comes to the residential sense, I, I clearly haven't worked it out yet because I had, we own a property in, in Morningside and I decided that, uh, and, and we were approached and we, you know, the, an agent that sold us the house approached us and said, I've got some great buyers. They've missed out on two properties. We want to sell our we, we would still like you to sell your property and would you just, you know, take them through it? And so I said, well, I'll sell it. But, and I gave them a number that I didn't think would be achievable. You know, I, I bought the house two years ago. I put another 15% on it and I said, okay, that's probably a good number, you know? And, and, and they took the property, they signed the deal and, you know, they performed on the property. And I thought, well, I'm going to be able to upgrade for the same amount or alternatively, get the same house for less because the market's obviously bad. And what I discovered is that the market is definitely not bad. There's so much demand in the market. Transactions are happening very, very quickly. Um, and there's, there's very little stock in the market. Uh, and, and that I just didn't expect. So we then sort of decided, let's go and rent a property. So we went to go and look at rentals. Rentals are staggering unbelievable you know really really high rentals and you're probably achieving and i was working out on what the property is worth etc and you're probably achieving nine percent upward in terms of yield on the uh, properties at a certain level obviously you look at different categories mm -hmm. and and i just i got educated very quickly in terms of i should have done my market research before i put pen to paper as opposed to 
do my market research after I put pen to paper. And I think that's a lot of what the tenants, in going back to corporate real estate, that's a lot of what the tenants are starting to do is they are doing their research before putting pen to paper as opposed to going, I've got a business, I need a place to be, and they just, you know, take a decision, I'm going to move, you know. Instead of saying, hang on, what type of transaction or what kind of deal could I do if I stayed? What could I do with my current office if I restructured it? Perhaps I um, compacted the, the working space somehow and, and, and just restructured the occupancy to an extent or renegotiated my rental on better terms or um, signed a, a, had an early renewal of my, of my lease agreement. There's so many different structures out there and, and that's a lot of what the advisory space. We've got a corporate services team that advises specifically in that space with the you know the larger occupiers and the occupiers of the bigger footprint is to really dive into that space and understand what they're doing because often and we always say this often your best move is to stay exactly where you are so it it's a and it goes along with the landlords the landlords want to retain their tenants they certainly don't want to be losing their tenants in this market and so we advise the tenants to stay and to see what type of terms can be reached with the landlord Mm. You know, it's, it's, and I'm so glad that those are some of the observations that you made, John, because one of the things that, um, you know, I've cited and you, you so rightfully pointed out that obviously the experience that you've just gone through does vary depending on sort of which bracket or which price point you're buying at. We are seeing that, um, you know, because you've even mentioned Morningside, you'll find properties there within a certain, uh, you know, price point. There's quite a lot of demand for them. Um, if they're not priced adequately, you'll find that sellers do need to bring down their price. But yeah. when you actually price it well, it doesn't stay on the market. And this is one of the big tips that a lot of agents keep giving sellers that don't try to test the market by overpricing your you know, property because you're thinking, ah, if you know, the interest rates are low, let me overprice it. There are so many buyers. They say, don't do that. You know, do your market research, find out the right price point consult with your agent because they they're doing this every single day and they'll yeah. be able to best advise you this is the, the the price point that you should aim for that will ensure that you're able to get you know a buyer quickly and your property is not going to stay on the market and become stale for an extended yeah. period because fact, there's so have, much yeah you'll have people competing for it and then and exactly. it's so cool. when you decide to sell your property Ask your agent to do a to compile a, a comparative market analysis yeah. for you. Ask them yeah. to, okay, well, you're pricing my house at seven million. Why? What have you sold in this space? What is, and even more important, what's on the market in this pricing category right now? I want to know what I'm playing against because you know what. And uh, okay, I say that a lot. Some, some of the sellers seem to think that they are sitting on a gold mine, or, but. Way too time. many, John. Far oh. too many sellers yeah. think they're sitting on a gold mine, and they they were counting on that particular property or properties uh, doubling in value within a short period of time. So they're still, I say, they're deluded really because they they don't sometimes want to listen to what the facts are, what the comparators look look like, um, which is unfortunate because I've seen that the stock that stays on the market for extended periods and you're seeing it, you know, price reduced gradually um, is because it wasn't priced correctly. You know, sometimes there are other factors, but more often than not, when the pricing isn't right, that's when it's not selling because there are buyers, they are qualifying, banks are extending those home loans. So it's just become so unfortunate um, when you know sellers are reluctant and don't want to listen to their agents when they give them that kind of advice. Look, it's a it's a similar thing in the in the tenant market, right? We we run software which tracks. Um, I think we've got twenty two thousand properties that we track across the country and. Into those properties, we we uh, we run. I think two hundred and twelve different vacancy schedules arrive in the in the commercial space. Vacancy schedule is where the landlord sends you a, a list of those properties that they're looking to let. Obviously, the bigger landlords, the growth points are redefined that kind of thing. That list is bigger because they own more properties. The so the private landlords own one property. Well, it's either vacant or it's not. So if they send a vacancy schedule, it's because their property is vacant. If they don't send a vacancy schedule, it's because it's occupied, you know. Uh, whereas in a in a redefine or in a growth point, you'll always have a portion of vacancy, and that vacancy is either higher or lower. And you know, at the moment, the vacancy is sort of trending higher in the office space, certainly. 
but um, we, you know, we get that vacancy schedule. We put it into the system. The software then tracks that that rental in the market, and we look at a at a price band. You can imagine that any commercial property, office, warehouse, retail, whatever it is, operates in a universe. There are other properties that it is competing against, unless it's a, a very specialized property that can only take one kind of tenant and there's nothing else in the market. Then, of course, you're a monopoly. You can decide to set the price for yourself. Obviously, not too high because there's still the reality that that tenant needs to be able to make money running its own business. But there's always a universe of properties around you and you're either at the upper end of the band, the lower end of the band, or you're just sitting completely outside of the band. And so that's what you need to look at as a tenant. You need to look at what is, if you're deciding on a property, you need to look at the universe of properties around it to make that decision. And that is what any customer will do. Now, I was listening to a, a chat by Daniel Pink the other day, and he was saying, you know, basically in the history of the world, there's been this huge disparity between what the purchaser knows and what the seller knows. The seller almost always has known more than the purchaser. But you've seen this parity developing in the last 10 years of consumerism where the purchaser actually starts to know as much as the seller. And yeah. this has changed the dynamic completely. And so in that sense, you, need, you now as the seller or as the broker or the agent, you now need to know how to curate those properties to make sure that the purchaser understands where your property sits in the realm of the other properties that it's competing against. Mm -hmm. We are taking your questions and comments this evening as I'm in conversation with John Jack as the CEO of Galetti Corporate Real Estate. We're looking at how REITs are combating a challenging real estate market under COVID-19. I know we've taken a, an interesting route to our conversation. I uh, actually like our interesting route. We'll get to some of the things that REITs are doing right now. I asked you earlier on at home, what are you doing for your property portfolio um, when it comes to combating some of the challenges that we've seen uh, under this particular pin? Pandemic. We've got a great question here on Facebook coming from Andrika Alhanyan asking, what is the current vacancy rates in the office market sector in your Santon and Waterfall areas? Santon's very high at the moment. It's actually unusual. It's north of 20%, um, which is radical. You know, it's, it's, it's just not a normal scenario. But what had actually happened in Santon is that there was a huge development, obviously around the car train, there was a huge development spike. And as that happened, the economy went into decline. And this is sort of even pre-COVID, right? Yeah. So, and then you get COVID. So it just kind of knocks it on. But, but basically what happens is you get a lot of demand. You get these a, a very unique circumstance. Car train develops. Then these enormous occupiers start developing around the car train. Take Sassol and Discovery and Discovery, yeah. and all the rest. DNS moved into the mark. DNS Africa, yeah. Correct. So you've got all these guys. But what happened to their existing office space? Well, their existing office space now sat empty unless you were able to attract someone into the market. And when the economy went into decline, or it basically it wasn't in necessarily in decline, it was just no growth. Okay, so yeah. very very stagnant market, uh, and this is the this is the GDP of South Africa, just a very stagnant market, and no one could really afford to move into Santon, which trades at a premium typically. Okay, and and so only when Santon started to drop its rentals were they able to take in tenants. You know, MassMart moved into the old Discovery Building as an example. Uh, I think it was their game division. But those buildings then sat empty. And before prices started dropping, then prices started dropping. And so uh, tenants were attracted to the market and then COVID happened. And COVID just put a, a huge like break on anything. Everyone was like, oh, do I want to sign a long lease? Or do I go into flexible workspaces, for example? Um, flexible workspaces, I'll talk about as well, because they've seen this acute impact. You know, it's either full or it's empty or it's full again or it's you know and so it's just this up and down scenario with them but you know what we've seen now is that they're full again you know everyone's gone back because they're saying well you know in the interim period i'd actually like somewhere to be i'd actually like a, a place for my business to be but i want it to be on very flexible terms What's happened then is the, the landlords have actually started to offer flexible terms. You know, I saw um, Arrowhead, for example, the other day, they said, listen, come and move into an office. We'll fit it out for you. We will, you know, sign a five-year lease or a three-year lease or whatever it is. 
We'll fit it out for you. We'll spend the money on the property. And you, for the first six months, you decide if you're going to move out. So test it. Come and test our offices, which is a completely unique concept, you know. And then after that, obviously, your lease becomes a little bit more permanent. We've also seen landlords saying, well, and I take Texton, for example, we'll create a product for you, you know, and, and, and now referring to real estate as a product, uh, we'll create a product for you that works for your business and we'll design it, we'll cater to your business. And, you know, that's starting to understand what does that occupier do? What might happen to them? And so they're, they're creating a product or a service. They, you know, they start seeing that office as a service instead of like, well, you know, take it or leave it type of pricing level. Mm-hmm. Which could and then, be a lot of demand. And, and I think, you know, I, I actually love how that is what's happening now um, within the, I'll say the corporate real estate sector, because far too often you found that if you were a, you know, if you were an occupier or if you're going to be a business that needed uh, space, even this sp- decking out of that particular space was. Uh, fairly standard really for everybody a landlord would typically say well these are you know the three options that we have um more often than not you would just you know choose the space allocation and you know the decor and that would pretty much be it whereas now there's beginning to understand the needs of their individual tenants, making sure that spaces are also curated accordingly. Um, And I think one of the things that also is great, obviously, for that is that people who then work there, so normal people like the viewers at home who are working, are finding themselves going ultimately to be working in office spaces that cater to the nature of the work that they do, um, which, of course, is, is quite great. I want us... And I can already tell you, John, because our conversation has taken a very interesting turn, talking more, you know, corporate real estate, which I'm absolutely loving. So I'll probably bring you back more for, you know, REITs. Um, I don't want to start REITs now. So apologies to people who are looking forward to REITs specifically, um, because there's there's a great follow-up question from Andrika, who had asked a question earlier around vacancy rates, who's saying, and I love this question. She's asked, she says, a lot of people are working from home. Are property investors intending to repurpose their portfolios? And how has COVID affected the development of commercial properties, especially conversions of your B-grade buildings to green buildings in the upmarket areas? Hmm. Yeah. Interesting, because it's already happening. And it was already happening when these properties were sitting in this kind of like flat market. And you're seeing like Athel Yards, for example, um, Marcus Sussman at, uh, at Capstone had repurposed the old NAMPAC head office to a residential leasing. It's, he put in, I think there are 190 different individual units which you can lease on a residential basis. They've got a gym. They've got a co-working space. They've got a rooftop garden. It's amazing. It's called Athel, Athel Yards. And, there's, and then you go and look at Black Brick, another example. Yeah. So Seth has got in, they developed Black Brick. There's the old SAB HQ. They developed that and they're doing Black Brick 2 across the road. And you've got all these. And then on the back of that, you look at Easy Properties. Easy Equities launched Easy Properties, which basically took the old, um, you know, one of the old, uh, an older model where you got a lot of people buying into a property development. It's managed by a professional team. It's, it's uh, you know, that development or that investment is curated by a professional team. And it gives you the opportunity to go and invest in property for a hundred rand, you know, and so they've just gone and, um, you know, fragmented the, the ownership and you can get in and out. There's liquidity in the business and it's a, it's a very interesting platform to go and have a look at, but that's what's happening. They're converting to residential space. Um, and they, you know, student accommodation in certain sections and then, uh, just flexible lease terms on the, on the more sort of, uh, traditional office space. And and that's kind of where it is, you know. And, you know, going to, just going to REITs quickly for, for two minutes is the REITs are looking at retaining their tenants. That's the main sort of um, message to market. We want to retain our tenants. We don't want any – there's no reason for any tenant to be moving. We'll come up with a scenario, right, and we'll work with you to stay. And and that's where a lot of creativity is coming in. And I must say that the, the REITs and the, the, the large listed funds and all the listed funds really have been really creative in coming up with good structures to retain their tenants and create interesting spaces for people. Because in the end of the day, I think people are people have realized that this 
work from home scenario is an interesting lifestyle shift because you've got you know these Zoom offices where lots of people are moving to the coast, for example, or to the country. And alternatively, people are still living in wherever around Santon, Morningside, you name it. And what they're doing is they're still coming to work, but there's no urgency to be there at 8 a.m. because when your boss walks through and sees that you're not sitting at your desk, wow, well, that's the that's the end of the world. And that's just old school. You know? That doesn't happen anymore, you know? The workplace is an environment for your company to build a culture and for people to collaborate and work together and work on projects and spend some time together. And you develop an identity by coming to the office. But that doesn't mean that you have to be there at eight. In fact, it doesn't mean that you have to be there on Tuesday if you don't want to be there. But you do have to be there some of the time. It's just you don't have to be there all of the time. And that's the differentiation. People are going back to the office. Our offices are at Melrose Arch. There's, there's, you know, under Melrose Arch, you know, on top, there are a whole lot of individual buildings. Under Melrose Arch, if you've been, is a super basement. There are two levels where you can see from one end of the complex to the other end of the complex. You can see all the parkings at once. And we've seen that go from literally in the hardcore sort oh, of, oh, as yeah. lockdown, it was like 10% full. Then it was 30% full. And, and as it sort of gradually increased, it's gone back to sort of 70% full again. And, you know, it's encouraging to see. But what you do notice is that if you arrive at 8 in the morning, it's not 70% full. But by 10 o'clock, it kind of gets to 70% full. And, then, but, and, and people are achieving a lot more by working how they want to work. Yeah. If you think, I, I actually need to get some stuff done, I'm going to work from home this morning, and then I'll go to the office. Well, it's great because you don't get distracted. You don't get called out for, let's go and have a coffee and let's do this. You actually focus for a bit. But for a team environment, you do need to be together. You do need to be, you know, um, having fun at work, as it were. <laughs> yeah. And and before we wrap up, uh, John, you know, we mentioned that you wanted to talk a bit more about the flexible workspaces and, you know, the trend that we're seeing there. I mean, I know one of the things, especially with the, the offerings like your WeWorks and your workstation. Uh, I like those kinds of, you know, offerings and I tend to sometimes like to work uh, in those kinds of environments or really good coffee shops, which unfortunately in the Joburg area are on the one hand becoming slightly difficult to find because we saw a lot of coffee shops close down because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, you know, that catch 22 when you're looking for a coffee spot type environment uh, to work from. And, and so I'm, I'm keen to hear what you've observed when it comes to the uh, flexible uh, workspaces. Just the radical volatility of it, really. Because it's flexible, you're either there or you're not there. And it's, it's, like, um, it's like anything. It's like a, any sort of stock in the market, for example. Uh, Bitcoin. When people start, when there's a lot of chat about but when, when people come up with a sentiment in general, yeah. generally a lot of people do it at once. And when there's another sentiment, everyone does it at once. So people decide, actually, we want to go back to the office, but we want it on flexible terms. Boof, overnight, uh, the business exchange fills up. Oh, there's another way of coming. Oh, overnight, the business exchange is empty. And that's the reality of it. You know, there's just, there's just huge volatility in that space. But, but I do think that they, and I said this right at the beginning of lockdown, I do think that that flexible workspace scenario is going to be one of the bigger benefactors of this change in working um, because you need a place to be and you need a place for your team to identify and be together at some point um, obviously different businesses are different you know you work in IT it's easier to work from home because you're coding or you you know you need to like focus and you actually don't need to be around other people there's no real point <clears throat> in having an office Sales environments, on the other hand, everyone needs to be together because they're talking, sharing ideas. Um, there's an energy in the office and, and you kind of work off that energy. So they're just different types of businesses. So it's not, it's not one size fits all. Mm. And, you know, one of the things that I, I appreciate about the flexible workspaces is we've seen, on, you know, on the one hand, a lot of small businesses have been uh, very negatively and severely affected by COVID-19. And on the other hand, we've seen an emergence of great small businesses that are coming up. And a lot of those small businesses do need some kind of, you know, office type environment. 
uh, for whatever purposes, sometimes perhaps their home environment, they don't want to be working there, he's been cooped up at home. I know I have instances where I don't want to be working from the house because I'm just like, I need you know a different type of environment. So you find that those flexible workspaces tend to land themselves quite well for you to have an anchor place that you know you have access to every so often. So a lot of entrepreneurs use them for hot desking and you know, you know that you can't have high rental costs and you want to keep all of your expenses for your small business as low as possible. So I've certainly loved, um, you know, seeing the different workspaces and the trends, um, as you say, because there was certainly a time when it was completely empty. It was like a ghost town. And then there are instances where it's almost completely packed. So I think seeing the growth um, and the numbers in a lot of those workspaces has certainly been quite fascinating. John, I want us to leave it there. Oh, there yeah, I, I want to leave it there because I see we've run out of time. We're going to talk REITs another day. Um, I think this has been a great conversation around you know, the commercial property space because we, we often don't talk commercial property a lot um, on the podcast. We're going to bring in more conversations around commercial property because I can see that there you know, some viewers who want to get a good sense of it. And of course, REITs are an important topic to discuss because we always talk about diversifying our property portfolios as much as possible. REITs are a great way to diversify your property, very low cost. You don't have to you know, do a lot of the heavy lifting that you would ordinarily do when you're running a bricks and mortar property portfolio. So I do promise you we will have this conversation on REITs, especially for those of you at home who have who are already invested in REITs, saw the bloodbath that uh, uh, so many of them experienced last year and are probably even wondering, you know, should you be going into REITs? And already pre-COVID, you know, we we're not seeing the greatest returns in a number of REITs. So we'll definitely have John back so that we can unpack um, some of the challenges REITs are facing, but also how you should take a, a slightly long-term view when it comes to REITs. So, John, I'm already telling you now, uh, asking you. you, requesting now, that we're definitely going to have you back to talk REITs. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And that is John Jack, who's the CEO of Galetti Corporate Real Estate. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of the Private Property Podcast with myself, Uzaman Domwa Kumalo. It has been a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it is a Monday, so at 8 p.m. you can catch the Home Shoppers Show with Chad. Until then, I hope you're going to enjoy your Freedom Day tomorrow. And I'll be back on your screens on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. about five years ago. Fairy Glen is a really safe place and the people are really kind. Some of my friends live really close by in suburbs like Equestria and Olympus. In the morning I will wake up, make myself a cup of coffee, go for a jog, 
in the Fairy Glen Nature Reserve or even just in the neighborhood. It's safe, quiet and the environment is really nice. I love Fairy Glen because I'm near the city but I'm not in the city. I like to go to Pretoria Country Club to clear my mind um, on my own, to relax and just to enjoy a round of golf. In Pretoria East we really have nice uh, places to visit like Menland Mall and Brickland Mall that is really close by. There are also a lot of top schools in the area like Pretoria Boys High and Yoshko Menlo Park. One of the most beautiful places to see the whole of Pretoria is the Fort Capricorn viewpoint. And that's my neighborhood.